observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your archbishop of Banterbury, your evangelist of the imagination, and of course, your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I'm coming at you, Robcasting at you, you Imagination Connoisseurs, you members of this, the post-geek singularity community. Now, I gotta tell you, there are certain times when, oh, look, I bumped my camera. Uh, why don't I just go straight ahead? You know, let's just be straightforward about this. I don't need to talk at an angle. You know where I'm coming from. There are certain times in life. Being an imagination connoisseur can do nothing but put a smile on your face. And I think today is one of those days. I mean, we, I, I often talk about that we live in a time, we live in a, an embarrassment of riches if you're somebody who grew up loving science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Whether you want video games, whether you want action figures, whether you want movies or television shows. I mean, you can turn on The Boys. You can watch Carnival Row. Walter Tevis wrote The Man Who Fell to Earth. They're remaking that. You can watch The Queen's Gambit. I mean, for all the bitching and moaning and complaining, and yes, I'm not going to stop bitching and moaning and complaining about the state of Star Trek, but that's just one place that I can bitch and moan and complain about. For the most part, I'm always saying that we do live in a time of glory. Everything is glorious. And, you know, uh, today is one of those times. Today is one of those times that I have to look back and think to myself, huh, a couple days ago, I uh, opened this show by talking about uh, Gail Simone, comic book writer Gail Simone's tweets. She did a, a thread, a tweet thread about Zack Snyder's Justice League. And I thought of all the reviews that I've read, and I think I've read read all of them. Uh, she was the only person, the only professional, the only I don't know person that 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 really captured what it was, how I felt about. It turns out she really nailed it in terms of what I felt about Zack Snyder's Justice League. And I have to tell you. You know, I've been talking about this movie. I, obviously, I was very excited about seeing it. I've been talking about it for three, four years now. Didn't think it was going to ever happen. Didn't think, I mean, had to explain to people why a cut of the movie. Everyone thought, look, I don't care what anyone says. Everyone's retconning their opinions. And I will, I will, I will flat out state, after Justice League got made, it's not that the Snyder Cut didn't exist, but people were talking about it as if it were finished. And I was saying, there is no, there's no Snyder Cut. And so the narrative has changed, though, about what people thought, what people didn't think. You can go back and read what people are saying, what we were saying. I my, my, my doubts about it were based on the fact that I work in the industry, and I work specifically in post-production, and have for a long time. And, you know, I knew that, that it was a long way from ever being finished. So, and then, of course, the movie got made, everything happened, we don't have to rehash it. But... It doesn't change the fact that I always enjoyed, I've always been a staunch supporter of Man of Steel, and I really enjoyed the Snyder Cut, uh, well, the the ultimate cut the of Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. Do I think it's a perfect movie? No. But what I've liked about the Snyder uh, iterations of the DC characters are the feel of it. They don't, they don't look or feel like Marvel movies. As a matter of fact, they don't look or feel like many movies that have come before. They're very much their own thing. And for that, I, I have appreciated the films from that perspective. I hated, hated the 2017 version of Justice League. And Justice League was always my favorite super team, superhero team growing up. As I talked about with when I talked about Gail Simone, the first Justice League issue I bought off the rack was the giant size issue 114. That was my first exposure to the the crisis on Earth uh, Earth Three uh, with the Justice League, the Justice Society teaming up 
and going against the crime syndicate and forever I was in love with that. A lot of that probably came out of my my love of the mirror universe and Star Trek and I was seven when I got that comic and it you know, to say that it changed my life wouldn't be an understatement, but that was one of many things it did. It wasn't just one thing. There was a lot of things going on that were were quite amazing. And when I saw Justice League, I, I didn't understand what it was supposed to be. It felt, it was just so, it was just a mishmash. I felt like I was, I was trying to consume something that had been made by a bunch of different people. And it, it was made by a bunch of different people. And it didn't, it didn't at all feel like what Zack Snyder was going for. And even though it had his name on it as director, I mean, obviously we all knew what happened. So anyway, never thought the Snyder Cut would ever happen. Because in my mind, who was going to pay for it? There's always got to be, uh, whenever somebody does something in Hollywood, and in my mind, people are saying, oh, it's a couple million dollars. I always thought, no, it was probably going to be between 50 and $100 million to make the Snyder Cut. And the, the thing about that was, is that seems like, well, that's not very much money. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And the thing is, who's going to give you that money? Where's the money going to come from? And the money can only be given if people think that they're going to get something back, if they can justify the expense. When I worked at Warner Brothers, for instance, and when I worked there for two years, everything, if you got a, uh, if you wanted to get um, soft drinks and have them in the refrigerator, there was a purchase order for that. Every dollar was accounted for. So it's not like a studio can be like, yeah, here's 50 million bucks, go finish your thing, whatever. No, you can't give over that money because one, where's the money going to come from? As I've explained, uh, the studio just doesn't have a vault where they go down and grab whatever, however much cash they want to take with them and then do something with it. They can't do that. It's not how business works. It's certainly not how Hollywood works. And it wasn't until... HBO Max, and as I've said on the show many times, it wasn't until HBO Max uh, came into play that I, in my mind, and I said it back on in November of 2019 on this show, I said, you know, now that you have an HBO Max and they're going to try and drive subscribers and they need to get new content, because the only reason people are going to tune in to a new streaming service is if there's programming on that streaming service people want to see. That is the only reason people are going to watch a streaming service. That's it. The only reason you turn in, tune in is if there's something you want to watch. So I thought, I was like, okay, you know what? Now, maybe there's a reason the Snyder Cut could happen because HBO Max could justify the expense. And you think about it, I mean, television today, certainly Star Trek uh, is very expensive, episodes of Star Trek have cost in excess of $10 million. And if you think about it, four episodes at 45 minutes a piece, so you're looking at three hours, could end up costing you, you know, 40 to $50 million. Well, if you've already got the Snyder Cut, and the thing about, the, it was already shot. It's already there. And the cut, obviously, he would he Zack Snyder was working on the film four months even after wrap, so there was probably a pretty substantial cut of the film it just needed post no finished effects or very few finished effects or or unfinished iterations of effects and you know they would have finished effects like when we saw things in trailers a lot of the time what people don't understand is they will finish effect shots and put them in trailers and then they'll they'll still they'll keep working on them for the film but they will give you finished effect shots for trailers because they take shots unfinished shots to put them in trailers so I don't want to get too far in the weeds on that, but when I saw Justice League in 2017, I'm like, well, anything is better than this. And, you know, you saw two warring styles. And for me, it was always apparent this was a studio call. This was a studio, even Zack Snyder said it himself, that they lost faith in his vision for the films and the, and the, and the characters. They did. They lost faith in him, but it had already gone. That train had already left the station, and he'd already even shot Justice League. So it was unfortunate. Now, as somebody who has enjoyed Zack Snyder's films, as I've said, I was adamantly opposed to Dawn of the Dead being remade, and I went in that movie with, as a big sourpuss with my hands crossed like this, and fuck this guy if you're making, you're making Dawn of the Dead. And I liked it. 
and I was ready to I was ready to like burn the theater down. And I liked it. I was like, huh. All right. Like 300. Thought 300 was a great translation of Frank Miller's comic. Watchmen, uh, I had a, I have a, I have a more problematic relationship with, but you still can't deny that there is incredible love and devotion in Watchmen to the source material that Zack Snyder brought to it and uh, all the love that was put in that film. So I might have certain problems with it, but certainly not the execution. I, I wanted more of an adaptation as opposed to a recreation of the comic, but as far as recreations go, it, he does a pretty great job. So anyway, I I am no Zack Snyder hater. Um, I I have liked his films from a visual standpoint. They're fun for me to watch. I enjoy watching them. I don't think Sucker Punch was a particularly good movie, but I could certainly watch that film over and over again if for nothing else, the visuals. Put on some techno music, throw that on the screen, and just have it playing in the background. You can never not look at that movie and go, oh, that's cool. Um, so anyway, long story short, when it was announced that there was going to be a Snyder cut of Justice League, I was, I'm like, okay, I'm all there for it. I am, I'm excited. You know, I, I really hope that the idea that it was going to be four hours long at first, I thought it was going to be split into hour long chunks. Like it was going to be a series, but when they decided to make it one movie with chapter headings, I'm like, okay. You know, and the fact that it's four hours long, to be honest, I fucking love that shit. I mean, four hours long, a four hour long Justice League movie. Uh, this is what my seven year old self who bought that hundred page issue, Justice League 114. If you had told me when I was seven that they were uh, going to make a four hour Justice League movie, I would have said to you, my young seven year old self would have said, fuck yeah, they are. Fuck yeah. I just wouldn't let my mom hear me say that. But. I mean, even now, as a middle-aged man with one foot in the grave, we got a four-hour Justice League movie today. And first off, let let me just say, um, I was going to watch that movie at 12 o'clock. I was going to stay up all night, watch for four hours, and then do a YouTube show. About 10 or 15 minutes into my stream, which was clicking off, our internet went out completely. Spectrum apparently they do this late night. They they uh, do maintenance, so the internet was out for at least three hours because I was just going to stay up and watch it. I finally went to bed. There was no internet. Thank God when I woke up this morning, I could I could start watching it again. Uh, and I watched the whole thing, but it was very annoying and I was very upset. Uh, more upset than I would ever have wanted. I mean, I was so upset I was. John Campia throwing his headphones down and smashing them upset. That's how upset I was. I was very upset. I, I didn't want to smash anything in here because I was afraid to. But I was that. I was seething with anger. And uh, where where the internet went out for me was when Martha Kent is leaving Smallville, leaving their farm. Right as she drives by, the internet went down. If I was an actor, I would use that moment as a sense memory. Um, I wasn't happy, as you might imagine. Uh, so I finally sat down and watched the whole thing this morning. And I have to say, I loved every minute of it. I loved it. And, and I think, you know, as a, as an achievement, it's nothing like a Marvel movie. And look, people are going to say, well, how different is it than, uh, the original Justice League. To me, the original Justice League, and I mean no disrespect to all those people that came and worked on the worked on the film and took it across the finish line. Uh, it was a monumental mistake to uh, do what they did to Justice League. And again, I've talked about this before. This was this was a complete failure of the studio, studio leadership for whatever reason. There's really no reason to rehash it because those decisions are, are now relegated to the scrap heap of history now that we have um, the Snyder Cut, which I think is a magnificent example of fantasy filmmaking. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, I, I wish I'd seen it in IMAX on a giant screen. Now, here's here's what I would say is, um, I, I, before I get into what I really thought about it, I want to make some points 
uh, clear about where I personally come from. How do I judge things? And when I'm looking at a movie, if I'm reviewing a movie or critiquing a film, I always look at movies individually and what they are and what they are supposed to be. What does a movie set out to do? What is it trying to do? And is it successful doing what it wanted to do or wanted to be? Did the filmmakers succeed? Now, I don't I don't immediately compare and contrast things. It's not the way... Uh, to me, every movie is its own universe. Now, in the case of Zack Snyder's Justice League, it's a follow-up to Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. So it really is the third part of a trilogy or it is the end of of an entire story. I I would dare say that Man of Steel, because I watched Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, the ultimate cut yesterday, like I said it was going to, it is all of a piece. I mean, it is, it is to me, a, um, a, it's a trilogy and it all, it all works together. And in, in a way it's all one long movie, but I like Gail Simone, who talked about this before, I found myself captivated by, again, the feeling and the tone of the film. Uh, no other movie feels like that. And yes, while it is a superhero movie, and sure, they're fighting uh, a villain and in, in, uh, in, in protecting the world from, the, uh, from Apocalypse and from the minions of Apocalypse, and I... I, I just felt like when I was watching it that it was, for lack of a better term, a magnificent bit of fantasy filmmaking. It was it was everything I really wanted it to be. And now I understand that there are things that were going to be the same and all of that, but the imagery and the way the movie felt while I was watching it, it captured why I initially was interested in science fiction, fantasy, and horror, and comic books, and all that in the first place. You know, I've read lots of different iterations of Justice League comics, and some have caught the Justice League better than others. I love Justice League International, which is a comedic take on the Justice League that Kevin Maguire and J.M. DeMattis and Keith Giffen did. Uh, I, I, I loved all that. That's different than this. This was... This is modern myths you know this is akin to and, and i think different iterations of of characters are fine you can have so this is one iteration of the justice league this is one iteration of superman and aquaman and wonder woman but what i think is most important about the snyder cut is ultimately is you see a vision that is now restored i feel that in a way, the original Justice League was a bit of cultural vandalism. It was actually commercial vandalism because it was done for commercial reasons. But I feel that that the the Snyder Cut, the way it exists now, I I found it completely captivating. I thought what what's interesting is there's there is a look. Even I, I'm not going to say the movie's beyond criticism. I I think you could have uh, tightened up the movie. There's a lot of scenes that that I would have tightened up, but not a lot, not as much. Some people like get rid of all the slow motion. I'm like, no, 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 That's, that's not where I, where I would have, where I would have cut it. Uh, I, I, I think that there's sometimes like when you see it, there's a scene when Aquaman goes into the water and these girls are singing. This is the one thing the girls are singing for a long time. You see the back of this girl's head and then it's a transitional moment to Diane Lane, to, to Martha Kent. The, that transition and that whole end of that one scene and into the next, I think you could have cut that scene um, tighter, cut that transition tighter. But once you fall into the pace, and and yeah, you yes, could you could you take that cut of 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 what Zack Snyder has done, and could you have trimmed it up and made it work a lot faster? I saw somebody somebody on my Facebook feeds were saying that. Oh, I, I mean, this I could just cut this up. But I think that's kind of missing the point. Because for me, the the rhythms of the film, it has its own thing. It's doing its own thing. And it in my mind, it was the rhythm of myth. And it was harking back to the way I felt about these characters and reading Justice League comics 
when I was a kid. I mean, and it really, the way I've thought about the Justice League in my mind, this movie captured it all. And, like, there were moments, we've all seen the scene um, when Barry Allen rescues Iris West uh, in that scene. And does the car and Iris West stay suspended in the air for a long time? Yes. But as soon as Song of the Siren kicks in, a version of Song of the Siren, which is one of my favorite songs ever, I, I, I was just letting it, like, wash over me. And I'm like, this is fucking great. Now, this scene was not metal. It was not metal. It was lyrical, and it was romantic, and it was it was like a man singing the love of his life. I And I was completely captivated. I mean... It got me like right in the hole, and but then again, you know, I I I do talk about like Andre Andre Tarkovsky's Stalker and how a lot of people can't hang with that because of the pacing. But to me, some of my favorite movies, one of my favorite movies of all time, is Vin Vendor's Wings of Desire, which a lot of people say, "Oh, Rob, that movie's like watching paint dry." When I think it's one of the most compelling movies I've ever seen, it completely touches my heart. Well, this movie did the same kind of a thing. And sure, you know, you're watching Steppenwolf come to Earth and great battles. But even the battles, again, they hark back to some reviewer said it's much more along the lines of the opening of Lord of the Rings. And I just felt, I felt that I was watching a movie that was important to my imagination. That's how I would describe it. Important to my imagination. Um, and And it was... It was the culmination of how I felt about these characters since I was a kid and how I feel about these characters now. How I've always felt about the Justice League. And uh, that's why I I felt the whole movie was totally transporting. And sure, there are a lot of people that you you could nitpick this movie if you wanted to. But... I understand, like, the visual effects. I understand all of these things. I get it. I love the way the movie looked. Uh, I loved all the character development. I loved everything that they added to the movie, how you really got a sense of who these people were. Um, I enjoyed all of it. And I I just thought that it was a a monumental piece of fantastic filmmaking. And when I I mean fantastic as in fantastical. Uh, Would I put this movie up against The Godfather? Lawrence of Arabia? Certainly not. But to me, it was it was the culmination. It, it, it was mythic superhero storytelling like we haven't seen before. And I think that it's... Uh, it, 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 I just had a wonderful time watching it. And there were times I did turn to Elizabeth, who was watching it with me this morning, and I, I would say to her, I would say, I did say, I turned around, I said, how metal is that? But I kept my voice. I wasn't going to, you know, do it. But I will say, I will say, this shit was so fucking metal. I fucking loved it. I was like, yes, yes. What I wanted, it was so just exactly like what I hoped it would be. Oh my God. I was like, fuck yes. So there was a little bit of that. And I got that from this. And that's kind of what I wanted it to be. Look, I'm, I'm all like uh, discombobulated. Um, but so there was that too. And and there's something to be said for that. Not everybody can do that. And and that's kind of, look, I feel the same way about the opening battle uh, in the beginning of um, LOTR. And, and that's, you know, it was like looking at a, a, an Alex Ross comic book. You know, those kinds of paintings. You could stare at one of his. It was just, I I loved all that. And, you know, I guess because I, I, as a critic, as somebody who's been a professional critic, I've written for magazines and critique things, you could, I could sit down and, and, and offer a critique of this movie. But to me, what I loved about it most of all is, is that it is a, it's a triumph of perseverance of fans and also Zack Snyder's vision that let's face it, it's unique to him. 
And again, I'm always talking about authorship. I'm always going on about authorship. I The portrayal of these characters, like, I loved... To me, this universe now is Man of Steel, um, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, Wonder Woman, and Justice League. Four movies in the Snyderverse. And I would say uh, Wonder Woman 1 is definitely a part of that. And I was surprised... Uh, Themyscira is plays a big part in this movie, and I I really enjoyed the portrayal of the Amazons. Again, the way Zack Snyder's portraying these characters is kind of the way I've always thought about them in my mind. And I I just I really enjoyed all of it. There was none of it that I didn't enjoy, and I feel that part of it is because this movie was sort of made just for me. I've had a lot of a lot of my friends talk about how they felt pummeled or. They and I'm like I'm like I get it I understand I, I I get all that, but I think that in terms of my open mind open mindedness for different kinds of entertainment and judging entertainment on the level it's presented in, uh, I I think this movie did exactly what it was supposed to do on a grand scale. I mean there is so much imagination in this film, so many different levels to the imagination and the design work and everything that that happens in this movie. Uh, and I think ultimately you could look at this movie like, oh, who cares? It's just a, it's just a overblown Super Friends cartoon, and there's going to be people that look at it that way. But for me, I, I just looked at it as, as, as something that I've wanted to see my whole life, and I finally saw it. You know, it was, re it was revelatory, and I thoroughly enjoyed every minute and, you know, again, you could critique it, but for me, it's like, you know, why bother? What I, what I saw, what I, I, I just loved, I loved every minute of it. I, I, and I have to say that, that it was nice to see something I can go in and, and, and to be honest, I didn't know what to expect. Even reading reviews and things, reviews are never, for me, I, I watch movies in a three-dimensional way. Every single shot, every single edit, every single music cue, I'm listening to all those things. I'm watching them all at once. And for that, I have to say, I I just, I want to go see it again. Uh, I want to turn it, I want to turn it over and, or turn it on again and go watch it again. Um, uh, and it's, I thought it was, I thought it was fantastic. And uh, it put a great big smile on my face. And once again, in my mind, it joins the great pantheon of, of fantasy films that are, I think are hugely satisfying. Now, sure, there are people th that I think the pacing of it is going to be an issue for a lot of people because, you know, it's we're, we're used to watch. It's like, okay, I get it. These long push-ins, a lot of the slow motion. Sure, you could have speeded all that stuff up, but that was all part of it. You know, it's all part of the mythic feel of it all. And for me, it just worked. I loved it. And uh, I can't wait to watch it again. And uh, I, I I, wish... Now, look, I am not looking forward to in, enduring all of these people calling for, r you know, restore the Snyder verse. That's a whole different issue. Going and making a Justice League 2 now is a way different... It's a much different proposition than, than making... Um, this so i mean they had they had the original footage to make this from they spent the 300 million or whatever it cost to shoot this movie so they had that already uh to recreate that it, to make a justice league 2 you'd have to have all these actors come back and you'd have to come up with that kind of money and who knows if they'll ever make another 300 million dollar movie again in our post-pandemic world so i i hope we don't have to endure i'm not saying it wouldn't ever happen I just don't want to have to endure uh, hashtag restore the Snyderverse. We've got four, four, four movies. And in a way, you could say the movie ended on a cliffhanger. Well, will Darkseid come back? Probably, you know. Um, but for me, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, if it didn't happen, it would be fine with me because we have four wonderful films that exist in that universe. And I'd like to see more, but then again, you know, I'd rather see also Zack Snyder made three movies. Let him go make something new. But yep, that's what I thought, and I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I don't know, you guys. I'm I, I'm I'm specifically being spoiler 
free. I don't, I'm not getting, I know I'm being very vague. I'm not getting into specifics because I don't, I don't want to get into specifics. I'll get into specifics a little later. Um, but I certainly, I certainly liked it a lot. Yes, sir. Yes, I did. Um, and I, boy, I just, I really loved it. So, let's see. I'm going to see what you guys have to say. Andy from Oz writes in. Andy from Oz says, Dear Rob, I recently came across your channel and I would like to extend to you my appreciation. I found your channel a refreshing change of pace. I thought I'd write to you after listening to episode 644 in which you stated that with more information, people may be able to temper their feelings of anger or resentment toward one another. So much online chatter surrounding beloved cultural icons like Superman has descended into abuse and name-calling, and it's a real bummer. I consider myself a lifelong Superman fan and have thrilled to his exploits on film, television, comic books, and animation from a very early age. My father was a Superman fan as a young boy, and so is his father. Talk over why Superman is the greatest or what makes a good Superman story was commonplace in my household. As such, I admit... I have baggage when it comes to the character of Superman. When Man of Steel was released in 2013, my father and I went opening night, and it felt like our ideas about Superman were torn apart. We both hated it, and couldn't believe they'd made a Superman movie like that. In the years since, I've struggled to contend with people who have some interpretations and perspectives on the character that run counter to mine. For example, Superman as metal or a badass was never how I saw him. Fans can sometimes be like this. Our love of something gives us a sense of ownership and authority that is called into question when a movie is released that didn't vibe with how we saw the character of the, or the franchise. You ask yourself, am I just past it? Was I wrong all along about what this guy was meant to be? Do I not like Superman anymore? It can be oddly alienating to feel this way. Snyder fans will sometimes argue Superman comics and various issues support decisions to make Superman darker, edgier, or morally ambiguous. Some will call these comics source material. It's like they're saying the comics I read are the real deal on Superman. You are just stuck on some spinoff. For many comic book characters, this kind of argument holds true. If they made a movie about Martian Manhunter, the comics would be the source material, but with Superman, it's just not that simple. I've read some of the comics they mentioned, but never felt Superman was being defined culturally by that particular adventure. Like the Bible, Superman comics can be referred to as justification for any number of artistic decisions one might want to take. With Superman, all of the available media across comics and everything else, all of them are source material. They all matter. Superman is a cultural icon whose reach and popularity spawned the superhero industry we have today. Created in 1938, he was afloat at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade within two years. He was shortly thereafter a radio show, an animated cartoon, a cliffhanger serial, and a television show in addition to being a comic book hero. <clears throat> Many of the elements of Superman mythology were born out of these other mediums. <coughs> Excuse me. Jimmy Olsen was created by the radio show, as was Kryptonite. The Fleischer cartoons gave us The Flying. It was originally the Daily, Daily Star with editor George Taylor. Well, George Taylor became an astronaut and went to Planet of the Apes. Then became the Daily Planet with Perry White. It was once Sarah and Eben Kent, then became Jonathan and Martha. Through it all, Superman has endured. I'm convinced he will endure past whatever interpretation is currently being presented. Perhaps... There is never a last word on Superman. I have no great fondness for any of Snyder's work in the DCEU, but I've come to appreciate that other people vibe with it for their own reasons, and that's okay. This is how Superman was interpreted in the 2010s. I'm glad for Zack Snyder fans that have been able to see the Snyder cut of Justice League, and in these difficult times, everyone should find a bit of happiness where they can. There will come a time when fans of the Snyderverse may find new artists are bringing their own takes on the character. I hope my journey through this might be of help if they, like me, feel their interpretation doesn't vibe with whatever they end up seeing on screen. Thanks for taking the time to read this, Rob. All the best. Andy from Oz. 
Well, Andy, <clears throat> I think what's interesting to me, um, I guess because I grew up reading so many different iterations of Superman, um, I think I'm always looking for what is the core of the character? Is the core of Superman retained? And I think for the most part, the core of Superman is. I mean, I grew up reading really kind of goofy Superman comics, Superman Family, you know, Superman versus the Toy Man. And then there were other, like one of my first, I call it a widescreen comic, was Superman versus Spider-Man. That comic I thought was was amazing. Superman for all seasons is an incredible Superman story. There's all different kinds. What do you get? Uh, uh, what do you is, what do you get for the man who has everything? What do you get for the man and uh, whatever happened to the man of tomorrow? The Alan Moore stories or whatever. Um, they're all different kinds of Superman stories. And I guess you know when I sit down and and watch something, I don't. As I said, I don't watch it expecting it to be something else. There were things about Christopher Reeve's Superman <clears throat> that I didn't really dig. George Reeves, I thought, was better. Christopher Reeve, I liked the stronger Clark Kent, the bumbling Clark Kent of the original Superman the movie, Richard Donner's Superman the movie. I, I don't know if I dug that so much. I always liked it when Clark Kent might have been a mild-mannered reporter, but I like when he was, like, uh, still a dude. The same. I grew up with the adventures of Superman, and seeing a different kind of a Superman got a little weird. But I think you're right. I uh, Everybody's got different versions of the character, and this is just one version that we're being presented. I happen to like this version of Superman because it is the Mount Olympus version of Superman. The characters do feel like gods. And when you see Zeus and Ares fighting in this movie, I mean, you've seen it in clips. But, I, I mean, look, the idea that the gods of Olympus exist... And we're fighting with Green Lanterns and Amazonians and Atlanteans and all the, 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 the realms of man against Darkseid and his minions. I'm like, man, that's all I need to know. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if you, if you could read this same story in comic panels and it would have been, I would have been just as engaged. So I, um, what can I say? I really like that. I, I really, it just really worked for me. Um, and I, I, what can I, 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 I just, I loved it all. I loved it all. So, uh, pasty copper top writes in and says, Rob, listening to a conversation a week ago with you and John about streaming services, possibly moving to long-term contracts. I have a worry that once they get you into a contract, they can change their content. What I mean is they have no re oh I think I read this uh, yesterday but I'll read it again. Uh, what I mean is they they have no real push to put new content on. What do they care? They'll have no advertisers to appease and the viewers have no recourse to cancel subscriptions if they're not seeing new content. At least not until the contract is up. For someone like me who still watches a lot of sports and have Hulu for that, I cannot have every streaming service, Netflix, Disney, etc. So I would have to pick a channel and hope that they do a great job for a long time. Right now, I can get a service and watch it for a month or so, then move on, depending on what show is on at the time. I got HBO Max, so I can watch the Snyder Cut uh, and and Godzilla vs. Kong. Then I'll probably drop it. Do you have any worries? I, I You know, I hear this a lot. Look, streaming services are not going to all of a sudden not produce new content. New content is what drives them. People want to see new stuff. That's what they expect from their streaming services. So that's what we'll always get. You don't have to worry about... Signing up for a streaming service, and if you have to go on to a, if they do it like phone services where you sign up for a year or two, you don't have to worry that suddenly they're going to slack off and not give you new content. They'll always give you new content. You don't have to worry about that. So, that's what that's what brings, that's what brings people to streaming services. So you don't have to worry. Um, this one comes from Philip Owen. Philip Owen says, "Hello, Rob. First, I'm a little new to you." Been with you since this last autumn, and now you're a regular watch on my TV. Something I just wanted to bring up is Justice League being metal. Have you ever picked up the Steelbook Man of Steel double CD? Yes, I have that. It's the first ever, as far as I know, uh, a drum orchestra. Just to name three, John Robinson from the David Lee Roth Band, frickin' Jason Bonham, do I even need to say who Sonny is? 
This woman may not be metal, but I love her work, Sheila E. And there are 12 other fantastic drummers in that orchestra. I mean, how can Zack Snyder not see DC as metal? Yes, watching you metal out over Justice League made me smile and get excited for the 18th. Now, I have one more question to ask before I leave you with this letter. Have you ever seen the anime version of Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai? If you like big robots and sci-fi samurai action, please check it out and let me know what you thought. Here's a link to that. Ooh, I, I have not seen this. I'm not familiar with it, but I'm going to uh, put this link in the um, live chat. Uh, so you guys tell me uh, what you think about it. I don't know it. I'm, uh, I am, I do not know it. Um, so yeah, don't know it, but be well and happy, Philip. Well, thank you, Philip. I love when people write things in. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the, <laughs> the band, when you, when you have, when you have that kind of percussion section, how can it not be metal? Uh, so absolutely hundred percent. Um, boy, I have a lot of suggestions from everyone uh, sending in their playlist suggestions. So, yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. Let's see. Uh, William LaRochelle writes in and says, Rob, about the 666 theme, Max von Sydow had said in his culture, the devil is portrayed as a fool and a loser. Can you suggest any movies or tales that illustrate this? Huh. I wonder how a strong antagonist or villain can also be intimidating enough to motivate a story. But obviously, that is a cultural variation of the mythos that has been established. My knowledge of Swedish lore is limited with my knowledge of most things. William, that's a really interesting question. I, I don't know an answer to that. The devil is fool. I like that idea, but I, I'm, I'm unaware of anything off the top of my head. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'm just not necessarily aware of it. So um, I, 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 I just don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, this is uh, from Jeffrey Lindenblatt. Uh, Dear Robert, about five years ago, I started a project I wanted to start watching classic movies from the 30s on. The problem with all projects is how do I start? Mainly over the years, I've been collecting classic TV shows from the 50s to the 80s. I go back to the days when Columbia House would offer two to four episodes per VHS tape. I remember those days. That was the first time I got a complete set of The Twilight Zone. At the time, the only place you could get copies of the rare hour episodes, which are not part of the syndicated package, and classic Trek. I did not know at the time they they uh, that they sell their system, they would come out with 10 volumes. Wait, I did not know at the time... With their system, they would come out with 10 volumes, and if it sold well, they would come out with another 10. That's what you meant to say. I remember the disappointment when a certain series would not make it to the end. DVDs changed all that, where a complete season would be available in one small set. Back to the movie project. I decided to pick one of the seven major studios, Warner, MGM, RKO, Paramount, Columbia, Universal, 20th Century Fox. Before the days of the internet, the only place to get a list of film would be to go to the library and take out an encyclopedia-type book, or in my case, go to Barnes & Noble or Walden's Books to purchase the book I had in my collection, The MGM Story, The Complete History of 65 Years. I took the list of films and created a complete list. I started with the beginning of MGM Sound Films in 1929. The great thing about MGM Films that Warner Brothers started the Warner Archive. The great thing about MGM Films is that Warner Brothers started the Warner Archives 12 years ago, making available many hard-to-find classics from the 1930s. I was, at the time, subscribing to Classic Flicks, who at the time made available a renting system like the early days of Netflix, where I could rent these classic films, which would have cost me an arm and a leg to purchase. I would later purchase some of these films, but I just wanted to watch them once. Unfortunately, a few months ago, they stopped this service. I reached the year 1940 before the service ended, I can still get some of these films at my local library and even have now to look and even now have to look into pay or non-pay streaming services to see if the films are available or even on tape, an old word I know, or tape them off TCM. It's funny that it now looks like Warner Archives will be coming to an end. I know. 
The sign of its end has been coming up in the last couple of years. When they started, they made many films available for the first time on DVD and also some films that came out in the early days of DVD, which were sold out. Over the last couple of years, the focus has been more on releasing these films on Blu-ray, which is, of course, a progression. It's what happened to films from VHS to DVD to Blu-ray. It's interesting to note when Warner Archives started the story that was going around from collectors, I do not know if this is true or not, was that a Warner executive went to a convention and saw on many dealers' tables films from their Warner library sold as bootlegs. So the thought was, why can't we make money off these films? Also in the process, they got rid of the middleman retail stores. With the success of Warner Archives, other studios started to create their own MOD services, and mainly all of them failed. Over the last couple of years, Warner Archives' main DVD output was DVDs that went out of print that were originally available in stores. What is the future of classic films that have not seen their DVD releases? The streaming services owned by the studios have not made films available that were not already released on some form of DVD or Blu-ray. Right now, the only hope is third-party DVD companies, Shout, Kino, Classic Flicks, Apple, etc., One of the major studios, it seems mainly Universal, which includes Paramount Films before 1948, and MGM, have been releasing DVDs or Blu-rays of their classic films. This past month, it seems that your statement that Warner Archives might be going away might come to be true. Um, Shout for their April and May Blu-ray releases are releasing horror films that are owned by Warner Brothers, including The Awakening, Sphinx, and He Knows You're Alone. Shout was the home of 20th Century Fox titles until Disney bought the library. Also, Kino is releasing a classic MGM silent film from 1925, Lights of Old Broadway. It looks like they got their print from the Library of Congress. Now this brings up an interesting question. This film entered public domain this past January. In two years, we will be entering the beginning of the sound films like The Jazz Singer. Could these, that mean, mean going into the public domain? Uh, Could these third-party companies, including the king of public domain films, Alpha Video, start releasing these classic films? Now, the main question will be, how will the quality be? And if the studios will give access to their major negatives for these films? Just a thought, Jeffrey Lindenblatt. Um, You know, very good question. Here's the thing, and I, I say this on Let's Get Physical Media, and I've said this here a lot. Once the studios have their streaming services up and running, like they control, they have no more incentive to sell their movies. The reason they sold movies was because that was how they could monetize their uh, catalog. But unfortunately, and, and people always say, oh, there'll always be a niche market for these things. Maybe. Uh, I don't believe it. Sure. Sure. I will, uh, I like to collect, I like to buy my physical media, but 20 years from now, I don't think that's going to be the case. And unfortunately, as I've always said, our pop culture, the further back we go, the less important it is. And, you know, people become less and less interested in things as they become older. It's, it's, I mean, there's always going to be people watching these things, but unless the studios themselves, um, unfortunately, they're going to start looking upon their entire back catalog not as a cultural legacy but only in terms of money how much money do they make by putting movies from the 30s up on their streaming services how many people watch them unfortunately those analytics will be very clear and i think the danger of streaming is that our cultural legacy and remember every year that in we that goes on in 2022 23 24 25 the old movies get even older and there's less people interested in them every day. So from a monetary standpoint, they're going to be, will it be worth preserving those films? I, I, I hate to say it, but it, that's just the truth. And they'll have graphic analytics to support that. And each year there are less and less people that even the ones that are buying physical media that are inclined to buy movies from the 30s, unfortunately. There's always going to be some people. But that's the thing that I really worry about. As we move forward, our rich cultural legacy of films will maybe become less important. But that's only because I was born into a world where movies were very important to me. I talk about this with my friends all the time. Movies are not, they don't, I don't think they fire, everyone likes movies, but there's so much material now 
that you watch something, you go to the next thing. It's almost like a chore where when we were growing up, there weren't as many movies. I mean, there was still a lot of movies, but there was, I mean, 40 years ago, there was 40 years of, there were 40 years less movies than exist now. And so in my lifetime, there's certainly been a lot of movies and they get, the, the older the movie, the less relevant it gets. So I think what's ultimately going to happen is there's not going to be any more physical media. Even if it's a niche market, who's going to want to spend the money to do a transfer of a film from the 1930s? Where's the market for it? How many people on the planet Earth will buy that disc? And does that, can it earn out? Is it worth the, worth the money it would take to restore it and put it on physical media? It's an interesting question, but that's the thing that I worry about. Uh, the one thing about these smaller video companies is that you can get movies that weren't available for the longest time. And and that's why they're they're great to um, they're just great to to have around. It's it's sad with Warner Archive leaves us. It's uh it's kind of a bummer. Um, let me see what uh, you guys are saying. I know that I got the show started late because of course obviously um, I was doing. I uh, for those of you who don't know. I just got off an epic Midnight's Edge stream. We were raising money for the Latino Theater Company here in Los Angeles by doing hosting a reunion of Blood In, Blood Out, directed by the great Taylor Hackford. And if you haven't seen Blood In, Blood Out, I've always called it the East Los Godfather. That's how I thought of it. But it was we had a number of the cast and Taylor Hackford and Jimmy Baca, whose writings, he's a very famous Chicano poet, and his writings were the inspiration he came in and did a lot of the script work and uh it was a great it was a great time was had by all so um you know check that stream out if you like blood in blood out what what a wonderful stream uh we just had and uh it was amazing i can't even believe we were able to pull it off to be honest but we did huh so let me see where you guys are what are you saying um, oh, this is for 10 minutes. I want to go back, 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 back. Um, where was, it? ah, uh, Anthony Krauss became a member. Jesse C says, Hey Rob, seeing all those hot toys you got in the back really wants me to get one. What site do you re recommend to buy one? I get nervous sometimes when it's a big dollar amount and I'm on some shady looking website with just like an expert opinion. Okay, Jesse. There are the the first place you should go if you want to buy specifically hot toys is Sideshow. Sideshowtoy.com. Go to Sideshow. They're the official they're the official North American distributor of hot toys. But there are other uh, places to go like Toys Wonderland, but that's overseas. But sometimes they sell, sell things cheaper and even with the exorbitant shipping, you could still get it cheaper than you can get it for here in America. Another store that I go to all the time is the Big Bad Toy Store. Um, I've always had a great experience with them. I've not had a bad experience with them. Uh, another company is One Sixth Outfitters. You can go there, and they will always hook you up. So, yeah. Um, so there you go. And, and please write in and tell me what figure did you buy. Dakota sends in a tip and says, seeing that they are now wanting to do another Twilight movie, if they do, I'd like to see a more darkened tone for the movie this time and do more with Dakota Fanning's character, Jane. That's if she returns. To me, she was the most interesting of them. I thought she was great. By the way, I watched Twilight movies. I enjoyed them. Um, I thought she was the most interesting character. Uh, and the screenwriters this time need to give the actors better dialogue to work with so the actors don't seem so dead on the screen. If you catch my drift, Alice had a good backstory, but Dakota Fanning is one of my favorite actresses in Hollywood today. I never would have got that from your name, Dakota. But yeah, I know. I thought she was great. I think Dakota Fanning's a great actress. I think Elle Fanning's a great actress too. I mean, I think somebody should put them both in a movie where they're like, like hardened criminals that do bad shit. I would love to watch that. Uh, Andrew Christie is here. Hello, Andrew Christie. No spoilers. It was bonkers. It dips in and out of an LOTR, Athenian epic, an indie art house music video with the weird needle drops and singing, a noir sci-fi drama with Cyborg's backstory, and more. Absolute bonkers in the best possible way. I completely agree with you. 
Apart from some weird editing choices, a couple of small unnecessary scenes in the score, which could have used some of Han's musical touch, it's a triumph. Snyder, you're a madman. I want more craziness and to see how far he can push the envelope. I Look, I think, Andrew, you perfectly encapsulated it. It was crazy. It was bonkers. And I was there for that bonkers. And see, the thing is, knowing that, does the bonkers work for you or not? Like, I didn't want it to be anything but what it was, where a lot of people are like, ah, I wish it was more like this, or I wish it was more like that. I'm like, no, 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 because we have what that is. I'm all here for what this is. Um, that's what I want. I want the bonkers. Um, Matthew Smith said, Rob, this worked out so perfectly. My wife is hanging with her sister tonight, and I need to stay up till midnight to register for my vaccine. I'm putting the baby to bed, grabbing a shower, and sitting down to eat and watch the Snyder Cut. I am pumped. Well, damn it, you should be pumped because it's amazing. Um, my amazing fart. That's, you know, that's, how do you know? If you have an amazing fart, shouldn't it be someone else should judge it? My, uh, as a former Washingtonian, do you have any memories of the Mount St. Helens eruption? Oh, yes, I do. Do you think an adaptation of the, this event could make for a good disaster film? They did make a movie about it. Footage of the event exists that would be incorporated. Rainier is due for a worse eruption. Oh, my God. If Mount Rainier erupted in the summer, the footage, I mean, that would truly be apocalyptic. Oh, yes. Uh, Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. And I remember when it erupted, we went down to the the south end of the island. I think we went to the beach club, the Mersalan Beach Club, because you could see the smoke. You could see the plume of smoke. It was, it, it was very apocalyptic. And there was ash. We had ash. And it was crazy. I mean, what it, what was really interesting was... When you see something from that distance, it looks like a matte painting. You're, it looks like you're looking at a literally a matte painting that was painted in the sky. It was very incongruous. It was very strange and um, very apocalyptic. But yep, I was there, and it was it was pretty damn incredible. Doctor Crusher is a hot coog. In 30 years, do you think Star Trek will still be a part of the pop culture lexicon? And do you think Star Trek will still be primarily associated with the original crew? Or do you think the many variant series will bunch out uh, the original crew's legacy? No, I think that Star Trek uh, Star Trek is the original series and it, it, it is the next generation. I don't see... See, the problem, the problem is uh, nowadays especially in, in the modern iterations of Star Trek, and even in Star Trek Picard, they did not give us the characters and the storytelling that make us remember, um, that resonate with us. Because re what's interesting to me, and I think one of, one of the things about Star Trek, it's not just the characters, but each episode of classic Trek and Next Gen, it, it changed a little bit as we got into Deep Space Nine and Voyager, but they were stories with beginning, middle, and end. Uh, and so you went with you went with a character on a journey. So if you watched an episode like A Muck Time, you got to see that's the first episode of the second season of the original series where Spock has to go back to Vulcan and fight Kirk. Dun, 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 the reason people remember that is not just what it does to the characters, but it takes you on a, a, a journey with a beginning, a middle, and an end that resonates. You can think about it and be like, oh. The, I think one of the things about modern Star Trek and especially Discovery is what happens in every episode? Nothing. Not much. There's not much of a story there. There's So it's not resonating. So Star Trek, the Star Trek paradigm, which was every episode is an individual episode. And yes, it became more serialized later on. But the reason why I think Star Trek and Deep Space Nine, I mean Star Trek and Next Gen, the original series and Next Gen, continue to endure is you can pick them up anywhere. You can sit down and watch them and you can be satisfied. That's not true of modern Star Trek, uh, especially Star Trek Discovery and Picard. They don't even give you, it's all generic, you know, and, and the people that aren't generic are characters that you kind of feel guilty afterwards following around, like Tilly. Um but yeah, I think Star Trek is always going to be the original series and the next generation. And until they make a Star Trek series that has any kind of a cultural impact or resonates with audiences, um, well, it'll it'll always stay the same. 
Stay Positive Brother sends in a tip and says, Robert Zack Snyder's Justice League was incredible. I never thought I would see a true art film that was comic book based. By the way, I was also glad to see Zack Snyder distance himself from certain negative YouTubers. When we talk about what we love, not what we hate, we're much better. I agree. I don't know. I, people keep telling me I must have missed something. <laughs> I must have missed something. Uh, uh, I, I, I've got to. I've got to look into this because I. I don't know. I missed something that happened, and I don't know what it was. Uh, another person shoes says the Russo brothers were pushing Zack Snyder's Justice League. It shows that there's no rivalry between DC and Marvel. Um, uh, by the makers, hell, actors and directors just do the work. They work for many companies, just like comic writers and artists do. This versus thing is pretty silly. Look, filmmakers all pretty much like each other. Unless you're in direct competition, we all want our movies to be great. We all want our friends' movies to be great. And filmmakers want other filmmakers' movies to be great. Because you know why? We all know how fucking hard it is to make a movie. So when somebody's made something that you can find to be an achievement, again, it doesn't hurt to say it's good it doesn't hurt to recognize that something is awesome if it is um jack arnold says i know you love james bond's austin martin from goldfinger so do i but my favorite genre car is george barris's 1966 batmobile it had more gadgets than the austin martin uh and my second is the mach 5 bond could only dream of having that car he had look those are great choices i love the batmobile i can't wait to get my six scale Jazz Inc. Batmobile. Uh, it's going to be epic. I can't wait. But that, yeah, from when I was a kid, both the Mach 5 and the original Batmobile are two of my favorite cars from all time, of all time. Absolutely. I, I'm with you 100%. Those cars are great. The design was great. Um, they're iconic. Those designs are iconic. Um, Craig Stratton said, I was more intrigued than excited about the Snyder Cut. I thought the theatrical Justice League was utter crap. Glad to say I had a blast this time. Only a few nitpicks. I I think so, too. I think that's what it was. I mean, yeah, you could nitpick it all, but you can nitpick anything. I was just, I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. And it was truly an experience from beginning to end. I really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Manny Santos says, Uh, Sheriff Carl says, dude, start the Zack Snyder Justice League sequel campaign. That was the most comic book shit I've ever watched. It was. I couldn't even get through the Whedon one. Was it the greatest movie? Nah, but it was pretty fucking fun and very fucking metal. More, please. Like, I agree. Uh, bring it on. I, I mean, I want to see more. I really want to see the Ben Affleck Terminator Deathstroke movie. Please make that. Please. Please. As Shallon says, Zack Snyder's Justice League was Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring level for me. I truly wished I experienced Zack Snyder's Justice League in his IMAX theater with fellow fans belting out hellaciously deafening cheers. Hashtag restore to the Snyderverse. Well, the thing is, we have a Snyderverse, which is four movies, so I think that's that's a really good thing. Uh, a Black Jedi sends in a super chat and says, looking forward to having you on tomorrow. I'm going to be on a Black Jedi's channel. Absolutely. That will be fun. I wonder what we're going to talk about. Hmm. Ash Challen says, After the abysmal Wonder Woman 84, maybe Snyder's vision is the way to go for Warner Brothers. He cast all the leads for the Justice League, and so much of Wonder Woman, for the first one was his story. Wonder Woman 84 was Holy Jenkins' vision of the character. Maybe Snyder needs to have his fingerprints on these films. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, uh, I, I really didn't like Wonder Woman 84, and I really wanted to. I like the first Wonder Woman a lot. Um, Claudia says, Rob, I hate to compare, but hashtag Snyder Cut Zack Snyder took a big swing on part three and stayed out of the bunker, while hashtag MCU Kevin Feige hit a hole in one with a five iron. Or to paraphrase Obadiah Stane, Kevin Feige supplanted Star Wars with a box of scraps. You know, I, I think they're just totally different kinds of things. Um, I really like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is character-based, you know, I, and, and I love all those characters. That's why I buy I have figures of them all. But I think the, 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 the Snyderverse are about gods, gods amongst men. Even Batman is a god amongst men. And, you know, you're watching these mythical characters as opposed to real people. And, um, 
Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm just, I'm just there for it. I'm just there for it. Um, I, I think, you know, when you're talking about the different kinds of things between Marvel and DC and what they've done with their movies, it, it was, it was Snyder himself who said that the Marvel comedy, the, the Marvel comics, they're, they're like almost action comedies. And I, I agree with that. I mean, like, I love Beverly Hills Cop. Now, a lot of people aren't going to quite get where I'm get going with this, but Beverly Hills Cop is an incredible action comedy because on one hand, it's a pretty brutal, there's a lot of brutal violence in that movie. And the there's a, the, the great truck chase at the beginning, the truck with the cigarettes in the beginning, uh, it smashes everything up and, and the stakes are definitely high. There's great villains, but it's also character-based, a lot of humor, a lot of warmth. So to me, it was the perfect R-rated action comedy. I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe is kind of that way as well. It's kick-ass action, but it also has character-based... I mean, uh, it looks like uh, Falcon Winter Soldier is that way as well. That we're going to get something that that is... It's a lot more fun, whereas Zack Snyder's Justice League movies and his Superman and, and well, his, his A Justice League film... They're working on a different kind of a level. And and I think in a way, a lot of people, for me, I love that shit, but I think a lot of people think it's it's a little portentous and maybe pretentious as well. So but for me as a as a sci-fi, I, I take this shit very seriously. So I like it. And a lot of people they're gonna be like, give me a break. I mean, it it I I certainly think it's a certain kind of taste. And it's different. I mean, other than the fact that it, they're both about superheroes. I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe is doing something very different than what Zack Snyder was doing, and um, I like that that it's different, and, and that Zack Snyder's movies represent him, whereas the Marvel films, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, represents a lot of different people. They kind of have a house style, but you know, James Gunn brings his little zhuzh to the to the uh, Guardians, and then you have the Russo brothers bringing their uh, Michael Michael Mann to their 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 superhero movies, or you'll get a Taika Waititi doing a little humor. Um, and I think it's I think it's good. I I think that's okay. Uh, Jeff Yerke says, "Hi Rob, we haven't seen Zack Snyder's Justice League yet. We're carving out the weekend for it. I'm glad Zack has finally had the opportunity to achieve his vision. I'm not his biggest fan, but I'll go in with my mind open." It can't be worse than Whedon's cut. No, it can't. Um, the Yerk Man. Well, say hi to your wife, Jeff. Uh, always good to hear from you. Look, I think that's what it is. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a heavy metal superhero tone poem, and that's cool. Uh, Maximus says, "Woohoo! Bring on the nightscape, injustice, baby!" Wait a second, Rob. Did you just say you didn't like the Donner Christopher Reeve version of Superman? Are you a communist? Rob, I sided with you against our mutual enemy, Claudius, but this is too far. No, no, no. Come on, man. I love, I love this version of Superman. I do. I love Christopher Reeve's version. What I was saying is, I, I didn't necessarily like his version of Clark Kent, but I love Superman the movie. It blew me away. Loved it. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was great. So, Maximus, don't worry. I still love Superman the movie. Uh, KM Reviews sends in a super chat and says, Part 1, hey, Robert, you actually did an interview with me a few years ago on my channel. Thanks. Anyway, Oscar question about Justice League. Uh, uh, would Justice League be eligible for an Oscar since it's so different? It's basically a new movie. Like, how much does a movie have to change? Uh, I don't, that's a good question. I, I think it's a new movie. I think it would definitely be eligible uh because that's why it's called Zack Snyder's Justice League so Dakota says what would you consider a bad movie there are plenty to choose from but why put Howard the Duck on the same list of bad movies alongside Ishtar Ishtar is just that a dumpster fire but Howard the Duck can be seen as a classic but not great movie uh, but far more watchable than Ishtar and Howard the Duck is one cool duck that got laid by Leah Thompson on screen what more can I say well, that's a good that's a good point. I think bad movie to me a bad movie is is a bad movie does not achieve what the filmmakers set out to make. And that's why I think Howard the Duck, if you look at the original source material, Steve Gerber's stuff, which I like, 
which I have on in hardcover right over here. I'm a huge Howard the Duck fan, and I thought the movie was a complete misreading of what Howard the Duck is because they wanted to appeal to younger people, and I I I just think it was a misfire. Uh, although it has some great ILM effects, believe it or not, but I I think it 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 didn't succeed on that level. And to me, that's when a movie doesn't succeed. Uh, doesn't doesn't um, represent the filmmaker's intent. That's when I think movies are bad. Um. So, but yeah, I mean, I think look, there there is a certain charm watching movies like Howard the Duck, knowing they didn't achieve that. I can still enjoy movies on that level because people are trying. It's just uh, the vision was at odds with the execution. Doesn't always work, and I always think that's um, yeah. Doesn't always work. Uh, Jay Watt. Jay Watt? Just sending some love. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. That's very nice of you. Kinky Sphincter. Just pre-ordered the Hot Toys, Nightmare Bats, and Superman, and the Black Suit Weta. I agree. The movie was metal. What Kinky Sphincter is talking about is um, uh, the Hot Toys announced today that they are... We talked about this yesterday on... Um, Hot Toys, our toy, our toy discussion with Justin. They released uh, Sideshow is doing a black suit Superman and the Nightmare Batman from the Nightmare sequences. Um, they're re-releasing that as a two-pack. Woohoo! Who doesn't want that? Uh, Maximus sends in a tip and says, "Rob, I don't get into black and white or non-HD films like you and your long-haired ivory tower freaks." I watch Michael Bay films on streaming. I don't get into your Kurosawa, Truffaut, or Nolan. I hated Tenet. I'm not watching a movie twice. Well, that's the great thing, Maximus. You don't have to. You can do whatever you want. That's what life is all about, you know? But, but you know, do you, you should allow people who like their Kurosawa to, uh, to dig it. Uh, Derek Thomas Pierce Phillips says, Hey, Rob, the Brick Space showing our support. Oh, well, thank you very much, the Brick Space. They're amazing. Uh, I will always show my support. I think I'm going to... I will definitely show my support with you guys. Um, Frankie J sends in a tip and says, Zack Snyder's Justice League is the epic comic book movie I didn't know I was missing. I know, right? I love DC and Marvel Comics since I was just a middle school kid. Now, at 41 years of age, I feel this is the stuff dreams are made of from those DC comic book pages when I bought Death of Superman. Dude, that's exactly right, Frankie. That is exactly 100% correct. I mean, you, you have to... What I don't understand is... Like, I've always taken things for what they are. And and I think, like, exactly what you said. When you're reading the pages of the comic books... Like, when I was reading... When Justice League... The, the reboot of Justice League... The Grant Morrison Justice League... He was doing these big stories on a big canvas. I mean, that this Justice League fit right into that. I don't know what people are expecting from Justice League, but I got exactly what I wanted out of Justice League when I was reading them when I was a kid and when I read them now. It, it's the epic comic book movie you didn't know you were missing. I felt that way too because I thoroughly enjoyed it and um, it had a lot of pathos and heart and it was it was just fun to watch. I just enjoyed myself watching it. And it was great seeing those characters, like Gail Simone said, brought to life in such a reverential way. I like the reverence. I like the the over the top nature of the mythic presentation. So I think you're absolutely right. Brendan Sheehy sends in a tip and says, "Rob, you would think that streaming services would be a haven for comedy films, low budget, easy to market if it had laughs, and room to try new things with up and coming comedy actors. But all we get is toilet sludge, like the horribly unfunny The Wrong Missy." I I don't know. I I don't understand that. I think we I think you're absolutely right. I think streaming services have an opportunity to be a uh, an incubator for new talent and there should be a lot more chances taken, but you know, I think that'll happen. That will definitely evolve. Things will change, hopefully. Um but yeah, I I expect more from them. Comedies, you're right. I think that we'd get a lot more comedies on the streaming services. Um Jack Ketchum says, it was just bad. The first part with all the songs seemed like a series of commercials for something or other. Maybe perfume or cars. Well, I didn't feel that way. I mean, I guess because growing up in the music video era and stuff like that, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, 
Mike Alito became a member, but Dan, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy. I was there for it, but you know, different strokes, different folks. Um, uh, let's see. Anonymous sends in a tip and says, "Geeks and Gamers, the Geeks and Gamers team organized a charity stream on Uche's channel, and managed. I saw a little bit of that and raised fifty thousand for suicide prevention before special guest snacks Zack Snyder even joined the stream, and seventy thousand overall." Amazing how negative folks can have such a positive impact. Anonymous goes on to say, The so-called distancing from geeks and gamers was mandated last minute by Warner Brothers if Zack was to make the appearance. Zack, in all actuality, argued with Warner Brothers on geeks and gamers' behalf. Warner Brothers screwed him over again and generated controversy over a positive event. Yeah, I haven't followed up on this. I, I, I don't know. This is, I, this is what I take to happen. That, yeah, Geeks and Gamers raises $70,000 for suicide prevention and somehow they're a bad channel. Look, you know what? I was on Star Wars Theory stream when we raised $40,000. There's a lot of people from Geeks and Gamers. I mean, all of these people that are, that, who, uh, who's, who else is doing that? Who else is, is, is raising $70,000 for suicide prevention on stream? You know, I mean, you've got to understand people with dissenting views are, I mean, look, there's uh, there's a lot of look, there's a lot of toxicity. I understand that, but I mean, you know, actions. What are your actions, and what do they do? But I, there is this controversy going on, and I don't, I don't know what it all is. I haven't been following it. I've missed out on that because I was watching Superman or Man of Steel, and then Batman v Superman. And then I was so annoyed about not being able to see Justice League last night. I just went to bed. So I guess I missed out on this. Um, Danny boy. Says, hi, Rob. Zack Snyder's Justice League was epic. Now I want more. Zack needs to finish the Justice League story arc, but especially need more of Henry Cavill in his own Man of Steel sequels. Oh, and Batman versus Deathstroke, too. I agree, Danny boy. I want all of those things. Stub McShave says, the latest five-second teaser for Wheel of Time was announced on Rosamund Pike's Instagram account. It signals the promos starting to turn towards the general public rather than just turn toward the fan community. A trailer is expected in May. Hashtag keeping Rob updated. Well, Stubble, there's nothing I want more for you or more for the world than a great Wheel of Time series. So congratulations on that uh, and getting that. That would be amazing. So, yeah. Um, Anonymous says, the so-called distancing from Geeks and Gamers was mandated last minute by Warner Brothers if Zack was to make the appearance. Zack and all uh, actuality argued with Warner Brothers on Geeks and Gamers' behalf. Warner Brothers screwed him over again and generated controversy over a positive event. I already read that, I know, but I want to read it again because I just realized, I, I, I again, I'm not, I, I'm not up on what the, what the, um, what, what was not positive about that, like, even on the Midnight's Edge stream today, our Blood In, Blood Out panel was there raising money for the Latino Theater here in L.A. And um, that there were where a lot of these actors get that were in Blood In, Blood Out got their start. And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why you would complain about those people. Aeon sent in a super chat and says, our universe is correcting itself. I loved every second of Zack Snyder's Justice League. 10 out of 10. I did too. I did too. Claudia says, Rob, I love the Teen Titans as well as X-Men, partially because I can envision myself living in their world. Unlike the MCU, I think it's impossible for our society to survive in Zack Snyder's universe. Once Superman comes to life, it's a finite story. Oh, I agree with that. Uh, you know, I think I, I I don't, honestly, I don't want to live in the world that's depicted in Zack Snyder's Justice League, especially if Darkseid comes calling. But I completely agree with that. I mean, Teen Titans were my jam. I mean, I love the Teen Titans. I love that comic. Teen Titans and X-Men were like my Star Trek. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, Danny Boy says, but but then again, I, I don't I don't have a problem with this vision of of superheroes. You know, it's just one take. Uh I didn't want to live necessarily in Christopher Nolan's Gotham either. And I, I really like that take on, uh, on Batman. Um, Danny Boy says, Zach distanced himself from Geeks and Gamers on Uche's charity stream last night, which was meant to be for his daughter's memory. It almost stopped the donations midstream, but the co-hosts were professional and worked through it. Oh, I, I didn't, yeah, I've got to figure out what happened. I mean, you know, 
Also, I would say this. Remember, uh, uh, the fact that Zach came on and, and there is... That the people don't know about controversies that exist. We all know what the controversies are. We all know, and whether some are founded or unfounded, we know what they are. So there are, everybody's got to cover their asses now. But I would say this, Zack Snyder did come on that channel. They, it's too bad that somehow he alienated people. But I think everybody everybody needs to start thinking about things from a, a realist's perspective, I think. And you can't sometimes think about it from a business perspective. And, and and it was amazing that it all happened and that everybody raised money and that they, it was ultimately, I think, a good thing that happened. We should remember that. Um, uh, Star King says, this is just for that legendary gentleman stickered on your microphone, good sir. By the way, team recast T'Challa in full effect <laughs> with Frederick Douglass. <laughs> No, I've always been a big Frederick Douglass fan. I think Frederick Douglass is one of the great American statesmen. And man, could that guy give a speech. Let me tell you. He's one of the one of my favorite historical Americans. A great American. And um, I, I'm a big fan. Uh, Tim Beale, the, the Spider Monkey, says, I fully expect to get dragged for this, but while I liked Zack Snyder's Justice League more than Justice, I felt disappointed. One thing the theatrical cut did better was Superman actually felt like Superman in the final scenes, but that's the only thing. Really? Well, I mean, I can understand that. You know, everybody's different. I can understand that. Um, Goobers and Goobers says, I'm so pissed that Snyder called me out and dissed me. Boo-hoo. How can I get clicks without the hate, man? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I got to get in on this. I got to find out exactly how all this went down. I'm, I, I just, I, I, again, I'm, I've been so busy. I haven't figured out what, why I don't know what happened. Goobers and goobers, but I want to thank you, um, supporting the, 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 uh, channel. Tibula, the spider monkey said, it was good to see someone finally getting flashes powers, right? I love that. I thought it was great. I loved it. Oh, Alexander Wilson says I skipped over him. Did I? Oh, I did. You're right. Cause I was looking for anonymous. Um, uh, Alexander Wilson says, Zack Snyder said something on Geeks and Gamers that has his crowd upset. Also, I love the panel with the Blood In, Blood Out cast. Great casting, and I was surprised that some of the actors had reservations about playing gangsters. I'm glad you got to watch that, Alexander. This is so, okay, this is so crazy. So, this is why I love the world we live in. So, I was on a Midnight's Edge stream, and with the Latino Slant, Polly from Latino Slant, and Tom, and and we we're we we're just chatting, and I for whatever reason we started riffing about Blood In, Blood Out, and I I don't know if anyone's seen this movie. It's from 1993. Uh, I love this movie. Uh, I've always called it the East Los Godfather. I love the film, and um, I, it's all about the Chicano culture uh, in East Los Angeles, and a lot of it was inspired by Jimmy Baca, who's a Chicano poet and and very revered, a very revered American writer. And it was made, directed by Taylor Hackford, who made The Devil's Advocate and White Knights and Officer and a Gentleman and uh, uh, Against All Odds. I mean, a big populist filmmaker who's also, by the way, married to Helen Mirren, who jumped into the stream at the end. And we're all like going, let's do an Excalibur screen stream. And I, that's what I was thinking. But that was really cool because he's married to her. She was delightful. She was so cute when she came on. But what was really interesting about that was... Uh, I said over the weekend, I'm like, well, are you going to get Taylor Hackford to come on the, the the stream who directed the film? And thank you to my friend Chris Lee, who used to be a TriStar, and he was an executive producer of Superman Returns. I didn't – they're like, well, we didn't get Taylor Hackford. I'm like, you got to get Taylor Hackford to come on. And I asked Chris Lee, and uh, he li lives in Hawaii. And uh, I said, do you know anyone that knows him? And he put me in touch with – uh, Taylor Hackford's assistant made it happen. So in a couple of days, I got Taylor Hackford to come on that stream, and then he was the one that gave us Jimmy Baca's contact information. So it was a pretty incredible stream. I'm glad you you can see it; it's archived. Uh, I'm really glad you saw it, Alexander, because that was um, it was it was so great that it happened, especially for all of us that we love. And I'm sorry for skipping over your tip. Uh, T3 Media is sending a super chat and says, can we collab so you can teach me about Hot Toys? We can always collab. I will teach you everything you know about or everything you want to know about Hot Toys. By the way, if you want to know 
uh, my hot. There is a on the raw on the uh, Burnett Work site. I did. I made a video. I made it in one night, so you have to excuse the crudity of it. But it 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 was my Hot Toys collection from about five years ago. So um, you can check that out. Um, it's on the channel. So I look at that Rob's Hot Toys collection. I think Maximus says Rob. I think we live in Christopher Nolan's Gotham right now. <laughs> it's hard out there to be a tough love intellectual. Rob, I'm still scared to let my girl wear pearls to the movies. I even go to Trader Joe's packing. Those cashiers are too friendly. <laughs> I like this alter ego of yours. I think it's very funny. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle being kind souls from across these 28 known galaxies, I'm going to bring Rob Observations episode number 646 to an end. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank people for supporting the channel through uh, their tips and super chats. I want to thank you for sending me letters. If you want to send me letters, you can do so at thebrunettework.net. Free of charge. Just send me a letter. I'll read it. I still have a lot to get through, um, which is great. I want to thank my moderating staff. I want to thank Mike Bodden. I want to thank the Richard and everybody else. We got Joshua Levesque here. Uh, let's see who else is here. I don't know. Louise X. Sparrow is here. Hello, Louise. Louise has a great accent. Um... I don't know who else is here, but I want to thank you all for being here. Um, maybe just the two of you are here. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, Brian Heppard's here. Hello, Brian. Thanks for thanks for being here. Uh, I don't know who else, but if I missed you, I'm sorry. You know I love you. Uh, I will be back on the John Campy Show tomorrow, I would imagine, because guess what? Midnight tonight, Falcon and Winter Soldier. woo Cannot wait. Cannot wait. Um, Obi-Wan Dahomey, a.k.a. Beskar Batman, became a member of the channel. Chris, uh, Chris Stenfenogel became a member. And also, Ash Chowan sends in, I understand the reverence for Bozeman and Marvel not recasting T'Challa, but they should not retire the character. Like Ledger with Joker and Reeve with Superman, time heals and allows these iconic characters to continue. Maybe make Black Panther 2 a few years from now with a recast. Yeah, I don't know. But I don't, you know, I don't know yet. I don't know about that. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, we shall see. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I, I would like to see Black Panther continue. You know, I've, it's funny, as you know, I have my Black Panther Hot Toys figure right here. I haven't moved him, but here he is. And boy, do I love this figure. It's so great. And it's weird. I have Chaz Bo Chad Bozeman and Christopher Reeve just accidentally wound up together. But I'm going to bring an end to this chat. Remember, everyone you meet, has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say to all of you, go watch Zack Snyder's The Snyder Cut of Justice League and tell me what you think. And as always, have a better day. <laughs>